Hello, this is Deb Johnson coming to you again with Our Time to Quilt. Boy, has it been a week. The first thing started out with my granddaughter having to have some tests done, so I kept my grandson. And that was all fine. When I went to take him home, I met his mother halfway, and we traded him. And then I went to get gas for the car because I was running really low. And I had my two pups with me. And my little dog went to lean up on the window to see what mom was doing and lock the car. And sadly, my keys were in the car. So here it was, a hot summer day. Luckily, not as hot as it's been, but very humid. And the dogs were, were locked up tight in the car. My asthma medicine was in the car. And you know what happens if you have asthma and it's a very humid day. Plus the panic of not being able to get to my babies or not to being, not to being able to do anything. My, my cell phone was in the car. And luckily a lovely lady um, volunteered to let me use her cell phone. And so I called and couldn't reach Mark and called my daughter. She came up and she was wonderful. And when she noticed I was getting panicky, she had me sit in her car in the air conditioning because she knew I couldn't get my medicine. And uh, so we ended up trying to call, and I don't know exactly, we couldn't get a hold of the Good Sam Road service, right? And I mean, it was just a mess. And But she was calm, collected, and took care of it for me. And there were, there were a crew there, contractors, who were replacing the awnings on this gas station. It was a sheet station, by the way. And I like to give good kudos when, when, I, when I notice them. And these crew of guys came over and said, we might leave a little dent in your car, but we think we can get your door open. I was like, please, a dent's fine. <laughs> I just want to get to my babies, my dogs. And they were panting by this time. I was getting a little panicky and they were wonderful and i have i have called corporate at sheets to say please find that contractor and tell them what great guys they have so it did bring on a panic asthma attack and so oh, wednesday i was just pretty out of it it was that was an ordeal for me and uh, and the dogs were fine but it, you know i think i suffered a lot more than they did because i couldn't get to my babies but anyway, then Thursday comes along and we get quite a thunderstorm. And if you live anywhere in the southeast, you know what I mean about these thunderstorms that have been popping up. And with the hot, heavy air, it's just ripe for these, these really voracious uh, summer storms. So anyway... I knew that it got extremely windy. I said, hmm, I've never seen it that windy here at this house, but I have seen it that windy with wind shears or a hurricane I was in or a little tiny tornado I was in. And I, I just said, well, I'm not going to worry about it. But when I got up and walked past the window, I realized that two big trees across the street, we have a lake, a little pond across the street, and two big trees fell but they went opposite directions that sounds like rotation to me but anyway the unfortunately one of the big trees came right into my front yard and I had this wonderful dogwood that probably is 35 40 years old and they had planted the former former owner had planted a pink dogwood well pink dogwoods are grafted onto white root dogwood rootstock because the white dogwood rootstock is a lot hardier. Well, evidently, years and years ago, a neighbor just told me this, the white rootstock sent up a shoot, and they left it. And over the years, what ended up, I ended up with, was a big dog, pardon me, a big dogwood tree that was half white and half pink. And it kind of became a neighborhood landmark. People would come by every May to sit, watch it and look at it and bloom. And I'm sad because the tree from across the street, which had a huge, you know, diameter, fell and cleaved that dogwood right in half. 
So my heart is broken for the dogwood. And I don't know how to make it do the trick it did 35, 40 years ago. So I'm going to order one pink dogwood and one white dogwood and plant them in the same hole and loosely tie them near each other and hope that I can get a little bit of that glory back because it was a magnificent specimen. But luckily, Mark was thinking, oh, no, I don't even have a big enough chainsaw and all. But the Neighborhood Association is going to pay for the cleanup. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Clarence and all the wonderful people. Uh, also, on the good news front, I realized when my power, I only lost power in little blips, but then my light started dimming back and forth and flickering, and I thought, this is not good. Something's going on. So I went out and looked closer at where the tree fell and realized the tree took down a power line to the street light across the street. And that was hooked to the live power. And I know it was live because that's where my power comes from, that same pole. So I called 911. They were terrific. And the fire department was out here in a matter of minutes. They blocked off the street, said, do not touch the tree. Do not go anywhere near the wire because they agreed it was probably live. And then, I think within a half an hour after that, the Duke Power, I have problems with them about the coal ponds, but <laughs> they did a great job coming out. Um, a two-man crew came out and put the power line back up, which was a huge relief because it was laying right down the middle of the street. And I was so afraid that ch a child or people walking. Um, and just these, these power, when you see a power lineman, you should make sure to thank them or be very kind to them. It was the th another thunderstorm had come up while they were um, putting up the wire. And so they had this bucket in the air and lightning and thunder. And I thought, oh my goodness, because I was sitting on the front porch watching them. And then by the time they just had hooked up the wire, the skies let loose, and they got soaking wet. And you know what? They didn't pause. They didn't anything. They're so good. And then, thanks to our city, we have a wonderful city here, Winston-Salem. And an hour after that, the city crew came out and cut up, cut the trunk of this huge tree that was right across the road and moved it out of the way and brushed the limbs out of the way so traffic could be restored. Not that it's heavy traffic area, but, you know, there are, I mean, it's, it serves the neighborhood. So, boy, was that exciting. So yesterday, instead of making the video that I was supposed to make Wednesday, at least, I drooled. <laughs> I felt like it. I thought, oh my gosh, maybe I'm not moving because something what's the next thing <laughs> but anyway um and my granddaughter's feeling better and the initial test results say that that yes it's celiacs but they don't see any obvious damage and we hope to get the report back um in a couple days from the biopsies they took because we just have to figure out how can we treat her celiac disease so she can live a normal well relatively normal life it's hard when any bit of wheat can totally inflame your entire digestive system and it kills off the little cilia that are in your intestines that move your food along and so you can just imagine how sick she gets and it takes a while for her to feel better so that's you know we're, we're, we're making progress and she was a brave brave girl when she had um, the IV put in and so she did really well, and I want to put a sh give a shout out to Brennan's Children's Hospital. They were wonderful, and she has a real fear of needles, and they totally made it a pleasant experience. So I want to give a shout out to Brennan's Children's Hospital. Thank you so much. All right, well, today is applique day. I'm going to try to hurry up and get this made and get it out because... Tomorrow, we're having a live feed Sunday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll be here. Bring your sewing project, and let's have some fun. This girl could use some fun. So, all right. I have some applique quilts to show you because, okay, applique number one. Applique is the process of 
sewing on decorative fabrics onto a larger piece of fabric to create a picture or design. Okay, could be a uh, garment, it could be a quilt. A lot of times, in fact, a form of applique is called broderie purse, and it's not like a pocketbook. P E R S E, and that comes from Persian embroidery. So it's broidery purse. And that's where you used to take less expensive fabric, especially back in the 1700s 1800s when fabric was so precious. Only came, you know, 30 inches wide. Um, you've heard of the whole nine yards? Because that's how much was on a bolt. So if you do something the whole nine yards, you get the whole bolt. And it, But it was uh, very narrow. And any kind of printing was very expensive. So a lot of times people would get a muslin and um, and it was a good quality and like let's say for a bed spread of curtains and they would get a muslin then they would get just a yard or two of the fine heavily printed flowery whatever and cut out the designs in the printed fabric and then sew it, applique it onto the plain fabric, create their own bedspread. Much, much cheaper than buying enough yardage to make a bedspread. So that's a form of applique too. Now, here we go. Here is a quilt I made years ago. I don't remember. I saw it in a magazine. I'm sorry I don't remember who the designer was. And I had a really, really good time. And I'll show you how to do these dots as we go along. But look how much it adds to the quilt. Let me lift it up so you can see the center medallion. And uh, whoever is the designer of this quilt, it was just beautiful. All right. So th there's the medallion. Isn't that lovely? And then I loved the four square the four patch squares around the border. So that's one quilt. All right, put that there. Here's another one. I took a class at Myrtle Beach Quilt Party and we did what looks like a normal geometric piece quilt. But look what we did on two sides. Isn't that cute? And I forgot the name of the flower this is supposed to look like. But, um, see into the corners? And this is another thing to tell you. When I quilt applique, I try not to quilt over applique. I don't want to hurt it, injure it. Now, in this case, I did do some def definitions. But what I do first when I quilt with applique is I outline stitch it. And then if I want to go in like I did here and do definitions, I can. But if you look, you can see where I outline stitched and in fact did what is called echo stitching where I just went a quarter of an inch or a half an inch and echoed that pattern out. But it makes for a beautiful quilt. And this is Stonehenge fabric, early Stonehenge fabric. Just beautiful. All right. Um, here I did a cute little sewing room quilt and I appliqued what are supposed to be rotary cutters on this. And I even did a zigzag stitch with silver thread to look like a cutter blade. Okay? That's one way to use applique. Here is a really pretty Christmas quilt I made. And I applique on the holly leaves and the poinsettia flowers, poinsettia which are actually the bracts, not flowers. They're the petals. See the little holly berries? The berries are polymer clay buttons I made. And uh, so if you have something and you don't know where to find the right buttons, polymer clay can be your friend. All right. Then I participated at a guild I used to belong to I participated in a garden challenge and I thought well if I'm going to do a garden inspired quilt let them let me show what really happens in my garden so there is a worm eating the broccoli plant there are sunflowers 
there is a birdhouse in need of repair. There are my tomatoes showing signs of some disease. Let's see. Here is a chipmunk eating my strawberries. And let's see, there's a worm here in the lettuce. So <laughs> this was a little tongue-in-cheek garden quilt. But I had the best time. Look in the center what you can do with applique. I found garden fabric, cut out the design, and applique it on here. So I've got my little basket with seeds and a little gardening tool down there. So it can be a lot of fun. All right. Here is another one. I've got many. In fact, whoops, let me see. See the quilt hanging on the wall back there? A lot of applique in that quilt. A lot of applique. So, here is something. And I just, this was in my peacock phase, which I'm a little bit still in. I sure do love peacocks. I got to tell you a funny story. We, I used to have a good friend, and he was Old Order M Mennonite, because I used to live in, in Southern Maryland. And I became friends with them, bought my animal feeds from them, ended up driving them to doctor's visits and stuff. And he told me this story. They had a peacock that walked around, a resident peacock. And he said he had an older gentleman get in his car, and the peacock was calling out male the males have the big they're the one the males the pe it's called peacocks and peahens and the peacocks have the big beautiful tail because they're trying to impress that woman and um they impress me too but um he said the peacock was calling out and the sound they make sounds like And it kind of sounds like help. The poor old man stopped and jumped out and wondered who he had run over. <laughs> and it was just a peacock. So, and I always thought when I had my little 10 acres in Maryland, oh, I want a peacock. Until I found out they love to perch up in the trees and on your roof and do a lot of pooping up there. And I thought, no, 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 we don't need that. <laughs> I always wanted guinea fowl, too, until I found out how obnoxious they are, too. So I stuck with chickens and ducks and pigeons, okay? <laughs> so here is a quilt that I did, my own design. And I used antique lace to edge the fans. It's supposed to look um, a little Asian. And I did broidery purse. See how I cut the designs out of the fabric and put those in. And I'll give you another hint. I couldn't find the colors. I wanted the fans to look very washed out. Very pale and delicate. And I couldn't find fabric light enough. So I bleached it. Just make sure though that you stop the bleaching process. And you can wash it really good several times. And then hydrogen peroxide will help you stop the process. So that the bleach won't eat through the fabric. But anyway, so there's some applique. And I think I'll back this up just a little bit because I am especially proud of this one. So, and if you look carefully, you'll see my fans aren't exactly even. You know, I was, I was feeling artistic, not, not careful. So, all right, let me change the angle of the camera and then we'll get into how do you actually do good applique. I'll be right back. Okay, here I'm set back up, and I want to show you some things. All right. First thing is, I consider there to be about four types of, um, t types of applique. All right, this is going to be a raw-edged applique. To make raw-edged, you take an iron fusible on the back of your fabric. See right here? And you can iron fusible on the back and then press it down. Now I left this in partially unpressed so you can see the fusible. And this gives you a nice, flat, neat and tidy looking applique. And I'll show you in a few minutes some ways to applique, to stitch this down. And this you stitch down with your machine. 
okay so this is where you use fusible and you cut it the same shape as this peel off the paper and then press it down so that's one method well actually there are several but this is a fusible and what I did though is instead of covering the entire applique I just cut thin strips to press on and that would leave the center a little poofier and softer and allows you if you wished to put cut pieces of batting behind to give it a little fluffiness okay and here's the piece ironed on except for this part you take the paper off and see I drew yellow to kind of show you where the interfacing is and then you can press that down and you can machine finish it but this just gives you a chance to put put a layer of batting under this to give it a little puffiness or if you just don't want the whole piece glued down with the, the fusible fusible web now we're talking about the raw edge applique and we have fused this down and then we're going to put it under our sewing machine and do a zigzag stitch and mine's on about 3.4 for width and about 1.8 on length because I don't want this to be a satin stitch I did not like doing machine applique when I thought we had to do a satin stitch used too much thread it was too fussy but now that we can just do a little zigzag I like it again alright so here we go and what we do is make sure that this needle falls just outside that fabric and go slow enough to have the needle fall just outside and then come in and take a bite and I'll show you what this looks like as soon as I finish this side but see how I just take it easy keep smoothing the fabric out I guess you can tell I didn't press it down good enough but it gives you at least an idea alright now when you get to the corner let me show you what you do then because this is important when you get to the corner I will use the little round knob let me put my presser foot down I'll use the little round knob to bring that needle down exactly where I want it then I take a stitch in place then I put my needle down then I lift up the presser foot I'm gonna go ahead and take this pin out and put it on this side so I don't run over it do never run over your pins Alex Anderson broke the main drive of her machine by running over a pen so I do, do not run over them alright ready then we start back up down this side and I hope you can see let me see how close can I get this alright see if you can see see how the needle right there goes right on the outside edge of the fabric and then comes in see that okay now finish this off all right and let me show you that's what it looks like so that's pretty easy now let's go talk about what kind of threads I like to use alright when I'm doing machine applique when I'm doing machine applique these are the threads that I like to use you can use an invisible Monta, monofilament and they've got some really good new monofilaments this is prim version um, superior threads makes a wonderful and they make it in smoky for dark fabrics 
or clear for light fabrics. This is to represent a thread that matches whatever applique you're doing. And then this thread represents contrasting thread, like for a theme. Let's say you wanted to do a blanket stitch because you wanted it to look a little more rustic, a little family-like. So this just gives you an idea of how you can do machine or hand applique, although I wouldn't use any of these threads by, for hand applique. But it just it helps to remind you to be thinking about how you want to do your threads. All right, then there's freezer paper. And this actually is freezer paper. And if you'll see, you'll see the shiny side for the freezer paper. You put it on the wrong side, the shiny side to the wrong side of the fabric. And then you leave an eighth to a quarter of an inch and you press it under like this. And then you can either hand stitch or machine stitch this down. And what I do, there's two ways. If you put this on a piece of fabric, like pretend that one there, you can slit the back of this and reach in through, the, to, through this fabric and peel the paper out when you're done. Or you can stitch it all the way around except for a tiny little area and reach in and pull the paper out that way. And it, you can iron it ahead but it just gives you a nice crisp edge, okay? So if you would imagine, imagine this. See that nice crisp edge? Now I prefer to do needle turn and I will, this is where, okay, I take this and put it on fabric like this. And then I use applique needles, and I'll show you more about applique needles in just a moment. But you put applique needles in here. Then you take a needle, and this thread doesn't match exactly, but I've got it out right now, so I'll use it. But the needles that I prefer to use for my hand applique, boy, that I, I threaded that one really well. I couldn't do that again if I tried, I'm sure. But um, the needles that I like to use for applique, you can get applique needles. I've been doing this so long that what I started out with are straw needles and milliner. Milliner used to refer to hat makers. But they're long, thin needles that are very flexible. Now, you will buy more of those needles than you normally do because they will get bent as you use them. But the beauty is that being flexible, they get in all the little corners really well. All right, so this is going to be needle turn. Now, I have knotted the thread. Let me run a little, run it across thread heaven. Now you know that they stopped making the thread heaven. They went out of business. But there is a new company making it. It's just silicone. And there's a new company making it. So don't pay $30 for a little tin of the old stuff. Because it, there is new being made. It's a little more expensive. I used to buy these for about $3. And I think the new maker is charging about six or seven. All right, so I've got a knot, I've got my needle, and what I do is you, it's called needle turn for a reason. You use your needle and see how I kind of push in at the edge and just run my needle down. You see what it does? It turns under that edge. So then you can either come in from behind, you just pick up like one or two threads and remind me to tell you what kind of thread I use because that makes all the difference in the world and you just you go under the fabric you come up take a little two bits two threads and see how that works then you come over here again I put my thumb here to help support the fabric 
take my needle push it in and run your needle down just tucking that under see how pretty that is now you don't get it quite as perfect as if you did freezer paper but you can sit in front of the TV you can take it in a car let me tuck this right down here that part didn't really want to get let me tighten up my thread I want to make sure that part got tucked in and in a case like this if it sticks up too much and it bothers you you can even use your finger to tuck it in and if you need to go back just a touch and grab it again so that you don't have anything that can pop up and mess up your applique work oh got a little knot in the thread I guess I didn't put enough thread heaven. It really helps if you use the thread heaven to prevent that. Hold on. All right. So now I bring my thread up through those two little threads right at the edge. See that? When you do needle turn, always match your fabric, or match your thread to the fabric, unless you're using neutrals. If your stitches are really good and small and right at the edge, you can get away with using gray threads, which will save your thread budget a huge hit. Because I'll go ahead and tell you now, I only applique with silk thread and I buy YLI silk thread and you can even get it from the actual factory itself they're in Rock Hill South Carolina and it's YLI you'll like it I think is where they got that from we took a tour I've been there twice to see a tour of the company and they've got some wonderful antique machines and sometimes I just go along and kind of finger press just by pushing on it keep it nice and crisp but you go straight down, come up where the next stitch, grab just two threads of fabric, pull it, tug it slightly, holding your thumb over it so it doesn't wrinkle, come back in, tuck under the fabric, and take another stitch. All right, whoops, don't let it get under there. There you go. All right, so do you see what I've got now? And I know that the camera is not really focusing like it should, but you cannot see the stitches. So that's the beauty of that. So, okay, that's how you do needle turn applique. And I like it because, like I said, you can go anywhere. And I'll go ahead and discuss applique pens right now. There are different kind of applique pens that you can buy, but I have a strong preference. Here are these little silver, they look like regular pens in miniature, and they're only at the most a half inch long. But my favorite applique pens are these with the white tip. See those? They're actually a little bit longer, but I like them because of the way these tips are dipped, and because they're dipped, they have a teardrop design and the thread doesn't get hung up on them. So this is my preference. And I'm trying to remember who makes them. It may be Dritz. I'm not sure. It may, you know, it might be another company. But look for, these are my very favorite. And they're about six or seven dollars, but they'll last forever. And as you can see in my little finger pin cushion, that's what I keep. And they're wonderful because I, just don't get my thread hung up on them all the time. Where these with the actual heads, see that? They'll get hung up. So that's why I have so many after all these years of these because of these because I don't use them. All right. So now I've showed you needle turn. Now there's another method, and I learned this from Eleanor Burns. And let me bring all this front and center for you. Okay. I saw Eleanor Burns do this. And she took, this is fusible interfacing. Lightweight fusible interfacing. 
And what you do is you put the bumpy side against the beautiful side of the fabric. Okay? So the pretty side and the bumpy side touch. Then what we're going to do is I'm going to take this to the machine and I'm going to stitch all the way around this. So let me reposition the camera and I'll be right back. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is stitch this down. Stitch the interfacing with the bumpy fusible side against the pretty side of the fabric. Now, this might sound odd, but trust me, it works. Alright, so place this in here and I stitch it depends if you're comfortable. Stitch an eighth of an inch away from the edge. If you want, you can stitch a quarter inch. Just make sure that your piece is sized accordingly. And I'm just using a little leaf shape. This won't take long. So I'm going to come in and stitch. And a lot of times I will shorten my stitch length too. But come in and stitch this all the way around the edge and I usually, you can see it, about an eighth of an inch in. Alright, so I'm stitching and stitching and stitching. Alright, so do you see this? Alright. I'll take this over and show you the next step. Now we're back after I sewed this. I'm showing you. Don't let me forget these things too. I want to show you this. But you take the interfacing, fusible interfacing. One side smooth, one side's bumpy. These little dots are the glue. And you take and sew it with the pretty side of the fabric against the glue dots. Now, very carefully, please be very careful with this because if you just try to cut without taking and separating it carefully, you will end up cutting right through both your fabrics. Then you've got to start over again. But see how I cut a little slit right here? And before you do this too, it's good to cut off any excess, any points like that. Alright, now what she does, let me see if I can do this. But, what she does is she goes in and grabs a corner, pulls it out. So I'm using these hemostats to pull it out like this. Then, she puts this in a straw, let me see, <laughs> then takes the blunt end of this and pushes this in like this. Now, okay, and you're probably going to want me to do that again. Um, I'll do it for the other end. But what this does is using that straw method, if the piece is small enough, it helps to turn it inside out while still being delicate on the piece. So let me show you that again. So you put a straw here, put a straw on this edge, you put this inside, Whoop. put the dull end inside, and then you push it, now I'm not doing that, hold on, let me get it right again. I think you, that's, here we go, put the straw in the hole. Use the dull end of the pointer and push it in the straw. And you're thinking, what in the world are you doing? And I just push it through to the other side, pull the straw out. Now I like McDonald's straws because they're much wider. But I have been on the lookout and I even found one this wide. So I could do good sized pieces with that. And if you need something really long, I found this. This used to be on one of those little balloons you can get. And I said, ooh, that could be a, a turner. So, and I'm just using here a skewer and the McDonald's straw. But look what ended up happening. So I put the straw in the inside and pushed the turner and pushed it through the straw. And it helped me flip this inside out. 
So now I take my point turner, I go in the slit, and you can also carefully use a pencil, a chopstick, um, a skewer, bamboo skewer, and just carefully pushing out the edges because you don't want to rip where it was sewn, but you definitely need to push out the edges. Okay? Now, so here we go. We've got this. And you just kind of work it with your fingers. You don't want the, the um, you don't want the interfacing showing once you've done the next step. All right, so here I place this leaf or petal on the fabric where it's going to go. Then you take your iron and you press it. And I learned this from Eleanor Burns again. Okay, now you've pressed it. Whoops, didn't quite get hot enough. Let me try one more time. And now it's pressed down. So then you can easily do it by hand or by machine. So that's kind of a cool method, isn't it? You just press it down. My iron didn't quite get it. In fact, you know what I would do? If that happened to me, you're trying to press this interfacing through another layer of fabric. Turn it on over through two layers, actually. So if you turn it over this way, it's just the one layer. You hold it. Okay, let's see if that worked. Oh, yeah, that worked. Well, it worked somewhat better. I have a feeling this interfacing is very old. So, what I would do then is just put a pin in it and then decide which way you're going to sew it. So, but do you see how you get clean edges? They're all encapsulated in the seam, so you know that when you sew, you're not going to have any problem with raw edges poking through. And it's a good way to, to catch the tips because those tips are tricky. Because what, well, let me show you with this piece. All right. So if I were sewing this, here's, and this is for needle turn, anytime you don't have it fused down. Let me tie my knot. All right. To come into a point, okay, I'm going to come up from underneath. Grab just a couple threads. See that? Just just a couple threads. Right there. And then I'll come up and come to the point. And you do at least three or four stitches. Okay? So I've come up at the point. Then I go down and lock it right there. I just went and stitched in place. Then I come over just a hair and do it again and lock it down like that and then come over and do one more so I like on any inside or outside edges you do it the same way three at minimum three stitches and that way look that is not coming up okay all right, and then if I were doing needle turn, this is where I want to have enough fabric to turn under, plus my three stitches, so I know that that's locked in, because the worst thing is to have the raw edges pop out. All right, so that, I've shown you those things, and this is the larger version of the Eleanor Burns method, and you see the interface, fusible interfacing, and see how nice it looks? And then you can just either hand stitch, decorative stitch, or machine stitch. So there you go. And now you know how in the world you quilt, quilt with a straw. There you go. All right. Now, we're, while we're talking about stitches, let me show you some of the decorative stitches that you can use on applique. Here is a contrasting zigzag. Here is a more blending zigzag. I used white thread, and it is so good you can't really see it. Then I used a blind hem stitch in white. Hardly shows. 
and then I did it in contrast so you could see it. See what the blind hem? It just comes in every once in a while, boop, takes a little bite, boop, boop, like that. Then there's a small blanket stitch. So see, this is zigzag. The blanket stitch mostly runs along the edge and just comes in and grabs a bite. And then here is the straight stitch, which you can also do straight stitch on raw edge. So here are a few of the stitches that I like to use. Straight stitch, blanket stitch, blind hem stitch, small blanket stitch, or zigzag. All right. Now, you might wonder, what are these glues doing here? And I'll show you. I have found that I like to sit down and not have to worry about where I'm going to place my applique once I'm sitting down. This is a really nice glue pen. It's a bone and it has a pink colored that will fade when it's dry and you just rub it on and you put it in place. If you want to make sure it's going to stay, you can give it a light press and then it's on there. Um, you can use glue sticks. Here is a fabric glue stick. This was a lot less expensive. Be careful with these. Keep them in Ziploc baggies or they will dry out. See this glue hasn't been really used in a while and see how it's already separating. So they don't last forever. Sometimes I think it's just better to get a fresh glue stick when you're starting each process. Well, I can't even get the lid off of this one, but um, you can buy Elmer's glue sticks. And you can always just use the white glue. And just, I find the best thing is to just put a couple little drops in the center because trust me if you put too much of this glue it makes the fabric so stiff you can hardly get a needle through. I've tried these kind of containers with varying amounts of success. They tend to get stopped up and that doesn't work that great. So but these are my methods. I can take and put my appliques on my fabric put them all where they're supposed to eventually be and that way pull it out every night and just sew down the latest you know whatever is glued to the fabric and see how I keep it, the glue away from the edges because you don't want it to stiffen the fabric and make it hard to stitch by hand alright a couple other tools that really help me are this is the Karen K Buckley's and they are heat resistant nylon and these will help you make your tiny berries and how I made this berry is I used a tiny little form first thing I do now this is the way I do it you can do it your own way but I take a bunch of these little circles and I baste stitch can you see the basting just inside then I'll take one of these circles I'll take one of these circles and I'll place it in the center of this basted fabric and then when I pull up the stitching look what it does whoops this circle might be a little big for this one but if I pull this up yeah, this circle was too big. One, Hold on one second. Let me get a smaller one. All right, here we go. So I place it on the basted circle in the center, holding my thumbnail there, and then pull the basting stitch. And I use a very heavy thread to do this because you hate it when you pull it up and it breaks. So I've now drawn this up see under here where I've drawn it up then I take my iron and I press it sometimes you can take a little touch of starch and put starch on it and then you very carefully pull out that circle to use again and pull your basting thread one more time and see it still holds the shape so I press it again and there you go. You've got the perfect 
little tiny berry and this is no longer this is one half an inch wide berry so and then recently I bought the larger circles because I thought you know that would be fun to try one thing I really I really like too is no melt mylar template plastic because this way I can cut out my own petals, leaves, whatever shapes I want in the sizes I want for that applique. And because it's no melt mylar, and it replicates these, but in your own sizes and your own shapes. So I highly recommend no melt mylar template plastic. All right, so I've already shown you that I like the straw needles and Milner needles and I love these wooden hold needle holders they help absorb moisture so that your needles don't rust or corrupt in any way all right then I just thought I'd remind you this this is a tape maker so it really helps if you're making stems and if you make like a, a double fold bias stem so that means you cut across the bias of the fabric and then you can use something like this to make it then what I do is I take and I fold I place the double fold and stitch it down near the edge and then turn over the rest of the fabric and it makes a very tiny nice stem I wanted to thank Virginia because she helped me learn how to make very tiny thin narrow stems. I like my thread heaven. I've showed you that before. My desktop needle threader. My finger pin cushion. A needle minder that has a very strong magnet that goes right on my shirt. And I like this because I don't have to put holes in my shirts. Look at this magnet. It just very strong magnet. So a needle minder. My applique pens that I keep handy marking pencil for marking things. Now, what I found, I like applique so much that I went to the, to the store and I bought a tool box. And this is, in fact you'll see on the top, applique supplies. And I love this thing because when I go to do applique I grab this and I know I've got everything I need to, to do applique work. And here it is, and I love the trays. This was $10, $14, and I can store lots of stuff down in here and all my threads in these trays. And as I told you before, YLI Silk Thread is my favorite. And you can get it from their factory for about $6 a spool. And a spool will last a long time. But I also mentioned the natural color threads and the neutrals and I tend I find to use a lot of these neutrals and they cover a whole lot of different colors because I you know if you buy spend six dollars for a spool of thread and buy all the different colors it can it can add up a lot so but now every once in a while superior superior thread company will have a sale and I'll buy one of their samples but um, I have found the silk threads are fabulous and they're so wonderful because they tend to kind of bury themselves into the fabric. Now some people say oh I don't want to use those because I've heard silk threads are so strong they'll tear cotton fabric you're not going to live long enough and I don't know if anybody will live long enough to see that happen truly the problems they had with silk threads the last century was because of the dyes and the mordants they used that they what the mordants they used to set the dyes were corrosive and they'd break down the fabric but these are wonderful and any serious applique person will tell you Silk thread is the way to go. It hides those stitches. 
So I keep all my needles, my glues, everything stays in here. So I just grab this in my fabric and I'm ready to do applique. Thank you for spending part of your day with me. We're going to have a live stream Sunday, August 5th, 3 p.m. And we hope to have another one August 13th at 3 p.m. And so on and so on as long as I'm in town. So I hope you learned something today about applique. Be ready tomorrow at the live feed to ask any questions or jot down in the comments any questions you have. I would love to to help you understand this process and enjoy it. It's so funny, early on in my sewing career, I swore I would never do hand sewing. Oh, that's just too, takes too long, I'm too impatient. And now it's one of my simple pleasures. So, until we meet again, be thinking of your next applique project. Thanks for joining me for Our Time to Quilt.